only one more thing that left me to do, and that is to introduce Sam Floriani. Sam is a digital rights activist and writer based in um, Melbourne. They are currently the program lead at Digital Rights Watch, where they advocate for a liberatory digital future in which everyone can, everyone can thrive. They're going to talk to us about human rights and tech policy in Australia with digital rights and digital wrongs. Please welcome Sam. I'd like to start with some stories. So, a teenager and her mother discuss accessing vital medical care on a popular social media platform. Now, this form of medical care is widely recognized as essential, but it's recently become criminalized. They think that they're having a private conversation, but their messages are not encrypted. The social media platform hands over their communications data to law enforcement, and the teenager goes to prison. And it looks like the mother will follow. A woman has built her entire community online. She spent hours, weeks, months building up her brand, finding her community, making friends. She's earning a living. Now, she knows that she works in a pretty stigmatized area, so she makes sure that she's really careful to abide by the rules of the platform. But they are vague, and they do seem to change all the time. She's got a whole community there, she's got access to a support network, they're sharing you know, crucial health and safety information together. And then, in an instant, she loses it all. All of her friends, all of her community, all of her pictures, her videos, her memories, it's all gone, and there's no pathway to appeal. A man is looking for a home. It's the middle of a housing crisis, and he's really stressed out. So he's going to rental inspections, and he's using whichever app the real estate agent asks him to. He starts to become a little bit uncomfortable with the kinds of questions that they're asking, especially as they become more and more invasive, and they kind of seem irrelevant to his ability to pay rent. But he doesn't want to be troublesome or annoying, because he knows that that will make it all the more hard to secure a rental. He misses out on securing a home again and again and again, because an algorithmic scoring system downranked him. And he has no idea why and no way to do anything about it. A young woman is living her life. Given that it's the modern digital economy, she has a mobile phone. And then one day, her telecommunications provider has a massive data breach. They blame hackers, but she later finds out that maybe their digital security wasn't quite up to scratch. Her details are online, and she has no idea how to protect herself or her identity. A few weeks later, her health insurer also has a massive data breach. More of her details are online, creating an ever more complete picture of her and her life. These companies in the news say things like, oh, well, we don't know of anybody who's been harmed the, as a result of these breaches. And yet she lives her life every day in fear that her ex-partner will be able to find out, with a little bit of effort, where she lives. So I could fill my entire time slot with stories like these. And these stories are all connected. They're all digital rights issues. And all of these stories are based on real events, and they have really real impacts on people's rights, safety, and well-being. There are countless examples of ways in which digital technologies are intersecting with systems of oppression, uh, injustice, and inequality, and in many ways making things worse. Conversely, digital technology has immense potential to improve the way that we live, work, and connect. Given that you're here today, I don't think I need to convince you of the good that technology can do and its immense uh, possibilities. But the risks and possible consequences when it goes wrong are immense, and that's where digital rights come in. So digital rights are human rights. The only real difference is that they specifically take digital technologies into account. So too often, when people talk about digital rights and harms, they think about them in kind of like an abstract sense, sort of ethereal, you know? We think about it happening in cyberspace, but not in the real world. 
But as you've just heard from these stories that I shared to begin with, they do have real, tangible, material impacts on people's lives. And as the divide between online and offline continues to collapse, digital rights become ever more important. And so the fight for digital rights at its core is about protecting people from these kinds of harms and more. But more than that, more than just protecting people from the bad stuff, it's, all about, it's also about you know, envisaging and working towards and ushering in a world where technology is really a force for social good. So today we're going to delve into the world of digital rights where tech, uh, politics and human rights combine. So, uh, in this session, we're going to do a little crash course on digital rights to begin with. Um, then I'm going to go through the digital wrongs and give you a bit of a, a, um, a roundup of some tech policy in Australia. And then we're going to finish up with some tips on how you can get involved if I've done my job well and you feel so inclined. Um, before we go much further, you probably want to know a little bit more about me. That's my cat. Um, She's my biggest fan, and I love her so much. Um, my name is Sam, as um, Daisy said. Thank you for your introduction, and thank you so much for PyCon and all of the organizers and volunteers for putting this on today. It's a real honor to be here, and to all of you for coming along and coming with me on this journey. Um, I, in my day-to-day -day life, have the privilege of living and working on uh, unceded lands of the Rwandari people of the Kulin Nations, um, and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And my background is in politics and data science. Uh, and I've worked in privacy somewhere or another for about 10 years in the, uh, in the public sector, in the private sector, and now in the not-for-profit space. Uh, I also have done a stint as the pro uh, program director at Code Like a Girl, which is an organization all about creating pathways for women and non-binary people into tech careers and advocating for more inclusive gender representation in the tech industry. And now I'm the program lead at Digital Rights Watch, uh, which is a civil society organization that exists to uh, defend digital rights and to protect digital rights in Australia. We do a couple of things at Digital Rights Watch. So we advocate for rights respecting socially progressive tech policy. So that means doing things like uh, writing submissions, going to parliamentary hearings, talking with industry, talking with government. And most of that work happens kind of behind the scenes. Uh, we also contribute to the public tech discourse. So things like coming here today to chat with you about digital rights or talking to the media or running events and campaigns and things. And we are working to build the digital rights movement in Australia. So sadly, the digital rights movement in Australia is pretty small, to be honest. And it's filled with in, like, brilliant, dedicated people, but it's chronically underfunded and under-resourced. So what we do is we try to work with different organizations, people across law, tech, social justice, other community groups, to try and build that uh, movement, because we, we know that we're more powerful together. OK, so as I said before, digital rights are human rights, as realized in the digital age. So that's a pretty big concept. So I thought we'd break some of that down. So one aspect of fighting for digital rights is protecting and upholding human rights that existed long before the advent of the internet. So things like the right to privacy, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, the right, uh, freedom of assembly, and so on. So these things existed long before the advent of the internet. And something to be aware of as we go on is that Australia doesn't have a, a federal human rights act or charter. And we're the only Western liberal democracy that doesn't have one. And this, sadly, makes the fight for digital rights all the more challenging. Now, for me, the right to privacy is absolutely pivotal in this fight. And that's because it is what we can call an enabling right. So privacy is really important in and of itself, but it also enables us to enjoy other rights and freedoms. For example, if you think of any social movement that's you know, pushed back against powerful institutions for social change, it is incredibly difficult to do that, incredibly hard to organize a protest or coordinate a union or you know, build a community based on resistance if you, are, if you have no privacy, if you're under constant surveillance. And so privacy enables us to gather and share and organize outside of the view of those who might want to be listening in. 
It's also tied to notions of self-determination, uh, personal agency, dignity, autonomy, the ability to develop one's self, sense of self and personality. It's also closely linked to ideas of anonymity, which is really important to keep lots of people safe online, especially in a digital ecosystem where it's increasingly possible to track everything that we do. So these are all really powerful concepts, and they're really important to us as individuals, but also collectively as a community and more broadly for society at large. So another aspect of fighting for digital rights is to fight for the establishment and protection of newer rights or reimagined rights that are fit for the digital age. For instance, many now argue that access to the internet should be considered a right. And given that so much of our lives happens online, you know, accessing services, work, socializing, it makes sense that this shouldn't necessarily be considered a luxury anymore. And this is connected to the idea of digital inclusion and uh, the digital divide. And just shy of 10% of Australians are still uh, greatly excluded from the digital economy. Digital security is another thing that people are starting to consider in terms of a right. Now, all of these things are actually really connected. And before I came here, as I was you know, working away on my talk, I was like, how can I possibly communicate to these people just how you know, sort of connected all of these things are? And it got, it got pretty um, hectic in my brain, to be honest. And where we're going is going to look a little bit like this, so I apologize in advance. It's, uh, I promise I'm not going to peddle like a conspiracy theory or anything. So this is my mind map. It's a map of my mind, it's what keeps me up at night. I have nightmares about this, it haunts me. Um, <laughs> and there are probably infinite ways that we could create a map like this. So, you know, if you've got your binoculars out and you want to pull me up on something, don't at me. It's, it's just one example. Um, and the idea is to demonstrate how these things are connected. So in the blue nodes, we've got uh, rights. Not all of them, I can't fit them all on this screen. So you can see the right to privacy, right to protest, yada, yada. In the purple, we have concepts, so ideas like surveillance capitalism, which is the idea of data extraction and accumulation for profit. And you can see that that is connected to datafication, which is the idea that everything that we do these days is able to be transformed into data. And that's connected to data positivism, which is an ideology that basically purports that we can solve any complex social problem if we just have enough information, enough data. And it's based on this assumption that everything in the world is knowable and measurable and therefore predictable. Now, this ideology is actually really popular in, in uh, Silicon Valley. For example, the ex-CEO of uh, Google once said that they could solve practically any complex social problem with just enough data and the ability to crunch it. So this is connected to the idea of techno-solutionism, which is a word to describe the phenomenon where we you know, really try to solve complex social problems by throwing technology at it. And try or attempt is sort of the key word there, because in a, lo a lot of instances, it actually makes things worse. And that's not to say that tech and data can't play a really important role in addressing critical social problems. But it is to say that when we are too quick to jump to it without considering the social and political consequences and contexts, then it can end up just creating more problems. So data positivism combined with datafication creates this environment that incentivizes and justifies collecting more and more data, including personal information. And this fantasy of data positivism establishes this kind of moral mandate for ever more intrusive data collection and invasion of privacy. It's justified as a way to solve these social problems. And so what we end up with is this kind of cognitive dissonance where you have you know, some companies operating under a very clear surveillance capitalism business model, but at the same time spouting rhetoric about how they're helping people. Now, perhaps um, you're really interested in the, cl uh, the climate, the climate, the environment, the world that we live in. Perhaps you want to see climate action. Now, that might not automatically you know, make, be really easily identifiable how that connects to digital rights, but it does. So if we think about uh, the right to protest and political organizing. 
So climate protesters are some of the most heavily criminalized activists in Australia. So for climate activists, or any activists, really, they need to be able to do their work by communicating securely and privately and safely with each other through encrypted services. Activists and protests also are often needing to be really aware of state surveillance and through th things like facial recognition technology or other biometric surveillance. It was only last year that the New South Wales police uh, imposed bail conditions that prohibited climate activists from being able to use encrypted services like WhatsApp or Signal. So all of this sits within a broader war on encryption and a rise of the use of facial surveillance technologies. And I think it's worth pointing out how this can and does have flow-on effects. A thriving and functioning democracy relies on our ability to hold those in power accountable. And again, that's very hard to do if you don't have any privacy or you're under constant surveillance. But we'll get to more on that shortly. This is also a good moment, I think, to acknowledge that safeguarding encryption and resisting facial surveillance is important for everyone and benefits everyone. You don't need to be doing anything even remotely sus to benefit from this. In fact, framing it as something that only benefits people who have something to hide is actually really problematic and damaging. Everybody deserves to digital security and privacy and to be able to go about their day-to-day -day lives safely and securely, even if it's just you know, using Signal to chat to your dad. That being said, a short word on criminality. In a moment, I'm going to talk about surveillance powers, and something to keep in mind is that these are often justified around ideas of criminality. You'll hear people say things like, oh, what does it matter, though? They're just going to use these powers on criminals. It'll never impact us. But I think it's important to note that laws can change, and so too can the notion of criminality. So here in Australia, we've seen that directed specifically towards climate activists in the last 18 months. In the US, we witnessed how access to pregnancy termination health care became criminalized really quickly. In many places around the world, simply being part of the LGBTQ community is enough. We also can't ignore the racial and classist elements when it comes to considering what's criminal and what's not, who, and who deserves to be under surveillance and who doesn't. And so I would strongly suggest that we exercise real caution when we think about what, when it is or is not appropriate to use invasive technologies for surveillance and to justify it in those terms. So maybe climate activism isn't really a bag. So let's use one more example before we get out of this nightmare mind map. So perhaps you have kids, or you know kids, or you just care about the safety and well-being of children and young people. And maybe you've heard about uh, algorithmic rabbit holes. Maybe you saw a Four Corners episode on it. So we can go down here into this, this section of our map. And so often in discussions about online safety, we really focus in on these rabbit holes. And to be fair, there are, that, there are a real problem. They do send people down some, to some really, really awful areas of the internet. But often the logic goes basically, well, OK, well, I don't, want this, I don't want children to see this content, and so we need to get rid of that content. But this only really considers part of the issue. What we end up doing when we, when we focus too much on policing and removal of content is that we end up playing this kind of game of whack-a-mole. And it often overlooks a lot of the complexities that come with content moderation, especially automated content moderation. And it can also overlook some of the harms that can arise when it goes wrong. For example, by disproportionately removing imagery of people in larger bodies or gender diverse people, or by taking down documentation of human rights abuses. And of course, on the other end, when content doesn't get taken down, that also causes harm. So it's a really sort of, you're walking on a knife's edge, it's really hard to get right. But that doesn't stop politicians from you know, spouting things like, well, why can't we just use AI to get rid of all of the bad stuff? And it's because it doesn't work that way. Humans are complex, and context is really important. So we also need to go up in the other direction and consider the engagement and recommendation algorithms. Um, and when we start thinking about that, we start thinking about the attention economy, which is predicated on targeted advertising, which takes us right back to surveillance capitalism. 
Now, that's certainly an oversimplification of all of the issues happening here, but what I think is important to note is that if we spend too much time thinking just about the sort of symptoms and dealing with it on that level, we miss out on uh, dealing with the underlying causes, the business models, the incentives. And so we just end up sort of you know, having the same issues over and over again. So the point of showing you this mind map wasn't to like lead you to apathy or despair or be like, oh my god, there's just so much stuff happening, I can't possibly. Rather, I'm hoping that what you can take away from this is two things. Firstly, that all of these issues are kind of start to become connected, and not always in ways that are immediately obvious, including connected with other social causes or issues. And the second thing is that there's no need to tackle all of this at once. So if you're interested in a particular social cause or a particular issue or a particular technology, then you can kind of pick that spot and focus on that, and it will play a role in the larger digital rights ecosystem. OK. So now we come to the digital wrongs section of this talk, where I tell you about just a handful of tech policy uh, legis and legislation in Australia that weren't kind of not great. So there's heaps of things we could talk about uh, in this, but I picked out three key areas that I think are really important to understand the sort of context and a bit of the history, so you know where we're at now, where we've come from, and where we're going next. So first things first, privacy reform. My true love and arch nemesis. Uh, <laughs> so protecting privacy, as I said, is about so much more than just keeping our information secret or to ourselves. It's about addressing individual and collective power imbalances and information asymmetries. It's about reining in corporate dominance, and it's about upholding democracy and safety. So in Australia, the main bit of legislation that governs how our personal information is collected, used, and shared is the Privacy Act. So this was drafted in 1988 based on a set of OECD principles. And aside from a few amendments here and there, it hasn't really been significantly changed since then. So the act is designed to be principles-based and technology-neutral. But even then, a lot has changed since the 80s, and so it's just woefully ill-equipped to deal with the modern challenges of, of the digital economy. So advocates and experts have been calling for reform to the Privacy Act for a very long time, and here you can see a very simplified timeline of, of the process of privacy reform. And you can see that there's just been so many rounds of consultation and yet, no real change yet, no real improvements to, to, um, that we need to better protect people and their personal information. Some of the key things that we're fighting for, just so you have a sense of what's on the table, is these things. So updating the definition of personal information. And this might not sound super sexy, but it actually has the potential to be really powerful. And that's because the definition of personal information kind of acts as a gatekeeper to the protections in the Act. So if we expand the definition, we expand the protections. So we needed to better include things like technical information, like metadata, as well as inferred or generated information, which is becoming you know, increasingly more of an issue. We also need it to in include instances where you can uh, distinguish a person from a group without necessarily knowing their name, but you can put, point them out in the crowd. And that's because privacy harms can happen even if you don't necessarily know the person's name. There's also currently political party and small business exemptions in the Privacy Act, which create a huge gap in the protections it offers. We also need to create a, a direct right of action or a statutory tort for serious invasions of privacy. And that would enable people to take their right to privacy in their own hands and take action when it gets violated or if it gets violated. And lastly, a fair and reasonable test to put the onus of responsibility onto organizations. Um, you know, organizations that collect and handle our personal information should be bearing the brunt of making sure that they're doing so fairly and responsibly. Currently, we operate under more of a, a model that places the responsibility onto individuals to manage our own uh, privacy through things like privacy policies and really long terms of service and clicking I agree and clicking I accept and collection notices and all of that, all that stuff that you know, we hate to read and barely ever do. And it doesn't work and it's manipulative. And so we need to shift the responsibility back onto organizations. So the next issue is surveillance powers. So over the past decade, we've seen huge increases in electronic surveillance powers in Australia, which have really wide-reaching impacts on privacy and digital security and the functioning of our democracy uh, more broadly. 
Again, I've put together a little timeline here to visualize what's been going on. And generally speaking, these powers are justified as necessary for national security purposes. They use quite scary rhetoric about terrorism and, cr and crimes, as I mentioned before. And in Australia, we have this pretty well-established tradition that once repress repressive powers are introduced, they are really rarely wound back. For example, just following uh, the September 11 attacks, Australia passed just shy of 100 national security laws, which had, many had uh, unprecedented rights infringing powers. And over 20 years later, only one of those significant powers has been repealed. And since then, three major pieces of legislation have been passed which are highly controversial and detrimental to digital rights in Australia. The first is the Metadata Retention Scheme, which you may remember. Uh, it was established in 2015 and basically set it up so that telco providers have to retain certain forms of data for two years, metadata. Again, this was passed under grand assurances that would only be used for the most terrifying criminals. Fast forward to 2016, and over 60 agencies applied to access the metadata, including local councils to follow up on fines. Jump ahead again to 2021, and the Obmudsman found that every single agency that they investigated, every one of them had accessed Australians' metadata without proper authorization. And jump ahead to this year, and it was reported that metadata was used to check up on the relationship status of people receiving welfare. An incredibly punitive use of these powers, and not exactly the terrifying criminals that we were sold this law on. Then, in 2018, we had the Assistance and Access Act, or TOLA, or the Anti-Encryption Act. Um, because you might remember uh, old mate Turnbull. Um, so this was super controversial, and the debate was really ferocious, um, and it really had echoes of the crypto wars in it. And basically what it did is enable uh, law enforcement and intelligence agencies to compel tech companies to assist them to be able to access the content of encrypted communications. It was rushed through the Christmas period, and Labor said that they had concerns about it, but they passed it anyway. So in 2020, uh, a, an independent monitor reviewed the act and, and suggested major overhaul, which still hasn't happened. Today, politicians and others are still using the same rhetorical tools to try to argue against encryption, although the emphasis has shifted away from terrorism now and towards people who disseminate child sexual abuse material, or CSAM. But what these politicians and other people in power fail to realize or fail to address is that strong encryption helps keep all of us safe, including children. And weakening it in any way actually undermines that safety for all of us in the long term. And then the last one, Identify and Disrupt Act. So this passed in 2021, and it introduced a range of new powers that enable law enforcement and intelligence agencies to add, copy, delete, and alter data on devices, take over accounts and lock people out, and, and to access entire networks with minimal oversight or accountability. Now, before it passed, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on uh, Intelligence and Security noted that there were serious flaws in the bill and recommended significant changes, including narrowing the powers and establishing oversight mechanisms. But did they listen to that? No, they passed it just under a week later. So an important thing to remember with all of this is that private and public surveillance is functionally intertwined. And what I mean by that is that government use of surveillance re relies upon commercial data collection, the data market, and, uh, and private tech companies. You know, be it through telco providers, uh, commercial facial recognition services, databases, digital platforms, etc. It's all really connected. On to online safety. So around the end of 2020, the Australian government started to really get a taste for taking on big tech. You might remember at the time, there was a lot of stories about Scott Morrison cracking down on social media. And alongside this, there was a lot of talk about protecting women and children as well. And so we ended up with the Online Safety Act. Now, this was surrounded with a huge amount of debate and controversy. Um, so the bill is complex, we don't need to get into the weeds of it here, but there are some things in it that are really valuable and reasonable, but there are also a 
a range of really broad, vaguely defined powers given to the regulator, the eSafety Commissioner, to be able to require the removal of certain content. So this applies to things, to illegal content like CSAM or pro-terror mater material, but it also extends to other categories of content like sexual material. And this is where it starts getting really tricky and starts getting wrapped up in sort of conservative ideology and has real implications for the freedom of speech and freedom of expression for many groups. What's more is that in able to be able to put these things into action, it, a lot of it incentivizes or requires increased policing, monitoring, and data collection online, which usually means increased surveillance. So in addition to digital rights advocates, there was serious pushback from sex worker groups and the LGBTQ community, because these groups are already subject to disproportionate censorship and surveillance online, and the act stood to uh, increase that. Fast forward, and there's a whole range of things happening in the online safety space at the moment. So we've got you know, proposals for age verification that come with huge privacy and digital security risks, also a kind of implementation nightmare. We've also got proposals to reduce anonymity online. And this, as I said earlier, risks uh, the safety of a lot of people who rely on anonymity to, to be able to be online in a safe way. We also have these increasingly complex requirements for tech companies, including the basic online safety expectations, as well as the online safety industry codes. So at the moment, we're waiting for the eSafety Commissioner to deliver a couple of standards, and we're expecting that those standards will include requirements for proactive detection or client-side scanning, which is a really controversial and quite a dangerous uh, use of technology to sidestep encryption. So the online safety space is a complex regulatory spider's web, and most of the time it ends up being a kind of tug of war between big tech and the government. And small tech companies or organizations are really starting to feel huge amounts of pressure to be able to meet the requirements that are really designed with big tech in mind. For example, in 2022, Twitter, a sex worker-friendly uh, social media platform, had to shut down in response to increasingly hostile regulation. Now, things like this make many communities less safe, but it also contributes to the consolidation and power of power and influence into a handful of large companies because they're the only ones who are able to meet the requirements. Now, none of that is to say that tech companies should be off the hook when it comes to uh, online safety. But it is to say that we need to be thinking really carefully about the kinds of regulations that we put in place. And we need, really, we need a, a technologically competent government who meaningfully engages with the tech community and the digital rights, uh, civil society space, and other impacted communities. It is really concerning when the vision for online safety in Australia is one of increased automated content moderation, privacy invasive age verification, a reduction in anonymity, and a crackdown on end-to-end -end encryption. These approaches increase surveillance, they increase control and monitoring, and in doing so, threaten to actually undermine the safety for a lot of people. I also think it's important that we recognize that all of this sits within a broader context of anti-sex, anti-queer, and anti-trans sentiment that is both online and offline. Much of the public discourse from politicians and others in, of, in positions of power have emphasized a view of online safety that centers upon moralism, puritanism, and sanitizing online space. It becomes genuinely very scary when the idea of offensive content or harmful content is your very existence, especially when it starts to impact the internet, which you know, many of my fellow uh, LGBTQ community members rely upon to access support, friends, and vital health information. We must vehemently reject the notion that the safety of children is in opposition to the freedom and safety of queer people and sex workers. Because it's not true, and it's a dichotomy that is designed to divide us and lead us to punitive and harmful internet regulation. <sighs> So I picked out the, the three key areas that I think are really important to focus on, but I also wanted to just flag a few things that are coming up. Now that you've got all the, all the context, you know what to keep your eye out for um, as we move forward. So at the moment, we've got misinformation and disinformation legislation on the cards, which is creating some controversy around when it is and isn't misinformation and what to take down and what not, because it's very complex. 
We've got digital identity on the cards, which includes use of biometric data. And we've also, um, there's been a lot of talk about AI governance recently. So they, we just currently, uh, there's an um, inquiry happening at the moment about different mechanisms for regulation and, and governments of, of AI. So you can expect to see a lot more of that in the near future. OK, so my hope is that this talk has helped bring you up to speed on some of the current digital rights issues and the state of tech policy in Australia. And even better, I really hope that at least one thing has resonated with you and maybe moved you to get involved with the digital rights movement in Australia. Technologists and tech workers like yourself have, are in such a wonderful position to get involved with this movement. As people who understand and actively work in tech, you have a lot of power to help others understand and to influence the direction of technology. So here's a little list of things you can do if you want to get involved. Not all of these will apply. Some will work, some, will work, some won't. So take what fits and ignore what doesn't. So firstly, educating and helping to demystify technology. So as I said, you're in a great position to be able to do this. There's a lot of misunderstanding of a lot of technologies and how they work and how they uh, impact people. For example, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you have seen firsthand a lot of the misinfo misinformation, a lot of the misunderstanding around how large language models work and what they are and are not capable of. And this kind of confusion leads people to misunderstand what AI can and can't do. And that can end up having real impacts on the decisions and policy making um, directions. So playing a role in demystifying how these technologies work for the people around you who, who don't necessarily necessarily have your level of understanding can be really helpful. You could speak up within the industry. So you have the potential to be a really influential voice um, within the tech industry in Australia. So this might mean things like advocating um, internally in your workplace or just with your tech community for rights respecting practices, privacy, digital security, in the inclusive design, and, and things like that. Um, Submission writing. So not, this isn't for everybody, but if you're interested, we could really use the help. Um, so one of the main challenges that we find with um, doing submission writing and, and, and engaging with the government on tech legislation is that there's just a phenomenal lack of technical understanding, it seems, in our government. And often they'll put forward proposals that don't really make sense or are sort of technically... Um, inappropriate or lead to technical consequences that they haven't foreseen or are really hard to implement and things like that. So uh, if you're inclined, weighing in on those kinds of things is really, really helpful. If you're somebody who builds products, perhaps you could play an active role in prioritizing digital rights in the design, development, and deployment of them. This might mean being, again, a champion for privacy. It might mean engaging with inclusive design methodologies. You could advocate for features that uh, empower your users to control their data and to make informed choices about how they interact with it. If you're doing side projects, you could consider maybe volunteering some of your technical expertise to um, organizations that are doing good. Or you could contribute to digital rights-focused or open source um, projects. This is a spicy one, tech unionization. Um, some tech workers overseas have started uh, exploring unionization as a way to collectively negotiate for better working practices for themselves, but also as a way to negotiate for a seat at the table to, be, to, pay, to play a part in the decision-making processes. So they, they want to be able to use this to not only impact the company that they work for, but also society at large and how they sort of fit together. So sadly, we don't have a dedicated tech workers union in Australia yet. But, I mean, what if you started one? Just, just food for thought. Or you could just work with your, your fellow colleagues and your friends, but I don't know, think about it. And lastly, uh, supporting digital rights organizations. As I mentioned right at the beginning, the digital rights uh, community and movement in Australia is wildly under-resourced. And as you have just heard, there is just a phenomenal amount of work in different areas coming at us from all angles all the time. 
So advocacy work might not be your cup of tea, and that's totally fine. Not everybody needs to do it. But please don't underestimate how much of a difference it can make by supporting people who are doing that work. So this could look like a few different things. You could um, make a donation. You could make a one-off donation, which is good. You could make a recurring donation, which is even better. It helps us to plan ahead. Uh, you could uh, organize something in your company to do recurring support. Or, of course, it, you could also um, get in touch with the organizations and see if you can help out in other ways. Maybe it will be helping with some, some technical projects. Maybe it would be uh, writing content or um, helping to run workshops and things like that. It really depends on the organization. Obviously, I hope that you will support Digital Rights Watch, but there are some other organizations in Australia that are doing really great work as well, including Electronic Frontiers Australia, the Australian Privacy Foundation, and there are state-based civil, civil liberties organizations as well, which you can um, look up if you're interested. Okay, so that brings us to the end. Thank you so much for your attention, and again to PyCon for having me. I hope that I have left you with some little sparks of ideas of things that you might be interested in following up, and that hopefully you will want to get involved in the digital rights movement in Australia. Um, thank you again. Hey, come back, come back, come back, come back. Do I, am, I, am, I, am I alive now? Can you hear me? Yay, lovely. Thank you so much, Sam. We have uh, the traditional sponsor, uh, sponsor speaker gift Yay. of a mug and a thank you card. Thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. <laughs>